Okay, I think that I get good quality sleep and I don't have so much anxiety as I used to have. Like, I used to have a lot more anxiety. Why? Welcome to the Raw and Real podcast. Are you dreaming of changing your life through opening a business? Or are you curious what obstacles entrepreneurs had to overcome on their journey? Then you're in the right place. My name is Agnes Billig and I'm your host. This episode is sponsored by SandWorkQuest, a really easy to use digital signature solution. They're a great company and I have a lot to say about them. And I'll tell you later all about it, but let's first listen to my conversation with David. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Raw and Real. Today's guest on the show is serial entrepreneur, David Arnoux. He's the head of growth and co-founder of Growth Tribe, a digital training company. Since 2015, they managed to train over 10,000 people across 900 companies, and this year they're hitting 6 million revenue. How cool is that? Hey, David. Thanks Hi. so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. So I wanted to start by giving our listeners a little bit of context about your background. Yep. So uh, when you were in your teenage years, you did a lot of internships during your summer holidays in the banking sector or at aid agencies <laughs> yeah. to find out what you really wanted to do. Yeah. And you had an achievement obsession already at an early age. <laughs> Where does that come from? Point. I don't know. It's a mix of, uh, I have no clue where it comes from. Uh, my mom actually has a story that when I was nine and I was asked what I wanted to be when I grew up, uh, that apparently I said I wanted to be a factory owner. And it was specifically, I think it was on Staples. I wanted to own a Staples factory because I was annoyed that booklets only had sort of silver Staples and I mm -hmm. wanted to have a uh, Staples that had a color associated with the color of the uh, booklets. So that was my nine-year-old uh, sort of dream. Yeah, so that's, eh, I don't know, it's kind of strange. And then I guess I have, for some weird reason, always been obsessed with learning and with a little bit of development and just with business in general. Um, and yeah, it's true. I did, so when teenagers, starting at the age of 16, I think, or 17, when everyone would go on holiday, um, like summer vacation, I preferred to do internships. To actually, because I feel like I was doing something, you know, sort of building something. And do you think that is based on your parents, or was there maybe another figure in your life that had that influence on you? That's a good question. Uh, difficult answer, though. I mean, m my dad is a super, super uh, intense worker, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, and he was always uh, like he ne he never he never rests, right? Mm -hmm. He builds houses. He's an artist. Uh, he's a painter. He's a photographer. He's also a business person. He runs. Uh, he runs a large company, um, so that definitely played, uh, yeah, the role model uh, uh, role. So your dad is also an entrepreneur? No, sorry. So he manages. He, he works for a pharmaceutical company, but he's uh, he manages uh, large branches of the uh, pharmaceutical company. So he just so he manages a lot of people, and he was you know wake up at six and he's back at ten, and on a weekend he doesn't rest. He rebuilds the house, and on the weekend he paints. So he always has to be busy. Always. Always has to be freaking busy. I'm like really chilled compared to him. <laughs> so there's that model, um, I guess. But uh, I, I think also if you look at a, a lot of entrepreneurs, it's a lot like the desire to um, I don't know exactly. It's like it's hard to do this psychoanalysis. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different variables, mm -hmm. but even in school, I wanted to have good grades and I felt it was important that the teacher thought that I was a good student. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's like some deep personality trait. I don't know what it is. So I, I think I know actually, it's just, there's a personality trait called conscientiousness, yeah, which is linked to self-control, to long-term planning. And I'm pretty high on conscientiousness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's it. You, so you have these five personality traits. You have yeah. openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism. And by the way, for the listeners, if you want to optimize for a good, strong career, you want to optimize for conscientiousness and you want to optimize actually uh, non-agreeableness. So the inverse of agreeableness. So you want to be somebody who's quite conscientious, hardworking, mm -hmm. long-term thinking, and not too agreeable. Uh, a lot of uh, 
top CEOs, etc., seem to have these um, top two traits. So how can you train these top two traits? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There, you could do like um, assertiveness coaching or non-agreeableness coaching. Although the tide might be changing. I mean, the way we're running Growth Tribe, we are quite agreeable, actually. So maybe mm -hmm. it's a new way of doing business. It's much more inclusive, uh, maybe much more millennial. Um, but conscientiousness is the number uh, one correlated personality trait with sort of revenue, educational achievements. It's an important one. So you can mm -hmm. have an extremely high IQ, regardless of what you consider IQ to be important or not. But you can be sort of extremely intelligent, emotionally intelligent, intellectually intelligent, general intelligence. Uh, movement intelligence, artistically intelligent, if you don't have conscientiousness, it reduces your chances uh, considerably to sort of uh, be successful or, or successful to be for a career, let's say, mm -hmm. or for education. Because conscientiousness is basically sitting down and having the self-control to do something yeah. more on the lot. On the, having on the that drive. Side. Yeah, so you can, well, The drive is good, but also having the control to actually do it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a lot of the time you have a lot of ambition, a lot of great ideas, but then executions came. Yeah. Uh, what's an idea? Technically, what's an idea worth? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Totally. What's, what's worth something is actually execution. And I learned this from Bernardo. He's our head of science uh, over at Growth Tribe and studies uh, behavioral economics and economics in general, behavioral psychology. And he, sh he shared a lot of the, the literature is quite astounding on this, that If there's one trait you want to try to optimize your kids for, for example, you can have the smartest kid in the world. If that kid doesn't have conscientiousness, then uh, they will just in terms of academic achievements and in terms of salary, there's less correlation. Doesn't mean you have a better life with a higher salary and better academic achievement. Maybe it's actually the opposite, mm -hmm. right? Maybe you actually have less less happiness or less less life satisfaction. But if that's what you're optimizing for as a human being or as a parent, then definitely tap into that trait. And I'm quite high on that uh, trait. So maybe I just got lucky with the, with the with the personality trait lottery. But I mean, you founded your first company when you were 20. 20. Um, in China. Yeah. Um, so you had that trait already back then. Oh, yeah. Like, okay. like since I was a kid. Absolutely. Can you tell us how that all happened when you founded your first company? The China story. Oh, yeah. So um, good question. Um, so I was in business school and decided to do another internship when I was 20. So you could do like, a, I did this dual diploma between France and the UK. Uh, and then there was, it's, it's this four and a half year study. But in the last six months, you can decide whether you want to sort of study or, uh, or you, you, after four years, you can leave and do an internship for like six months and you can come back and finish your study. So I'm like, I have two, three buddies that were in China already. So I was like, I'm, I'm just going to go there. It's the new El Dorado. Uh, it's where it's happening. It's exciting. Uh, I can learn Chinese. It's far away. I've always traveled a lot and I'd been in France for four years and I was like, okay, I'm done now. I need to move. And it was the hot thing back in the days, China. It was really the hot thing. And I thought, yeah, I've got an opportunity to do a, an internship there. So I went to do a, an internship. And uh, at the end of the internship, I met um, a guy who was in the company who was head of procurement, who basically was going, so head of buying uh in this uh, large company and who basically had enough and uh, was about to get fired actually uh and i thought i saw potential in, in this guy because i said the guy speaks chinese he can write contracts in chinese he has experience in procurement he knows how to deal with factories and at the same time there was another guy gregory salzman who was my uh, other co-founder who wanted to leave his uh company and who was just uh, sort of really creative guy sort of visionary and i just i spotted the opportunity so uh, it was great timing Yeah, but there's always a, so there's three, four types of luck. And one of the types of luck is I, being I, able to identify luck. So just, you, you stir the pot and you have to also be able to identify an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to do something. And I mean, I'd already been building small, not businesses, but had little side projects for already like a while. Uh, What so kind of side projects? Just small projects on... Uh, on the internet mostly so where you would build tools and test things no or? i wasn't really tools it was more um actually no it was more like creative stuff like uh, trying to get into photography a lot or mm -hmm. trying to get great into the get into design so it was mostly around these things like can i actually be a photographer can i actually be a designer uh, can i promote myself online etc cetera, etc cetera. it was like mini projects all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> And so we, uh, so we decided to just jump into it, uh, jump into import exports and start a sourcing company. Uh, we were Westerners in China. 
there was this large city called Yiwu in Zhejiang province. And there was an opportunity to be local players there to find products for companies uh, in Europe that needed to buy these uh, products. Uh, so I was just spotting that sort of, yeah, the timing was good. The stars sort of uh, aligned, uh, aligned there. And then you did that for a while. And yeah, then... so I did that for, um, I think it was three years. I'm really bad at dates. That's fine. For about three years, did import-export from China f as a trading company. Or for we would sell to large um, distributors or large retailers. Basically what they call xiao shampin, I think that's how we say it, which means small commodities. Okay. Uh, a glass, for example, mm -hmm. or a binder, or a, a bracelet, or um, uh, woven goods, just uh, a lot of different types of goods. And I was able to sort of master the business Chinese really fast. So it meant that we were there, we were on location, and all of these European companies, or even American after a while, they're trying to buy from China, and they just they need contacts on the ground who can go visit the factories, negotiate with the factories, identify which are the good factories, et cetera, et cetera. And then you founded a new company, Blue Lemon, right? Yeah, so that was with... opportunistic once again. I was like, oh, there's this thing called the internet. It's pretty cool. And there's this website called eBay. And we've got these amazing... We, so we essentially, we had this client that wanted male fashion accessories. And the accessories were really nice, really cool, um, cheap and great quality. And, you know, we were buying them for like, I don't know, 20 cents. And s when you are doing import-export, you have a really small margin. Yeah. So we thought maybe, you know, we could do what they're doing. We could put our brand on it and start a brand from the ground up um, uh, and then get bigger margins. And it wasn't so much for the margins. It was more like I wanted something more creative. Uh, mm. So import-export is great, but it's like you, you start losing your hair because <laughs> the and, margins are really small. And when was the point when you started having that feeling that you wanted something new? Well, I was already doing stuff that's really creative for the import-export company. So building the website, building the logo, trying to build the proposals, uh, trying to design catalogs, always on sort of the design side. That's the stuff I like. That's the stuff I would do in the evening, on the weekends. Uh, and back in the days, it was work we were working seven days a week, right? It's so like first company, 100 hour, not even exaggerating, like 100 hour weeks. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I've always liked the creative stuff, mm -hmm. either on the product side or on the design side. And just, I liked the idea of building catalogs and I was like, okay, maybe I can actually build tie collections and I can actually build a brand uh, and I can actually build a website and do the user interface for a website and the UX for a website and then started to um, just play around with it. And the first version of that company was actually just the eBay store. So let's test this. We had these cool little products that we designed really rapidly. We prototyped. We would cheat a little bit with the suppliers. We would always tell them that we were going to order a quantity of 10,000. And then we were able to build samples of like 50 per design or else mm -hmm. you can't get, you you get this, you don't get the, um, you, the minimum order quantity is usually 10,000 per item. So we'd say, yeah, we're going to order 10,000, but we, we have a really big client. We need 50 samples for all the departments. It was a little bit sneaky, but it's yeah, China. That's really sneaky. <laughs> that's a little bit sneaky. And uh, yeah, and then the small test put 20 of the designs uh, online on eBay, a little bit of eBay optimization and boom, it started selling. So I always like to trust early signals mm -hmm. and this was a sign there might be something there. So little by little, we diversified the revenue of the company and little by little, the import export uh, business went down and the brand sort of uh, went up and it's not like it crossed over when we took the decision. It was more like when it was like this um, and we were like, uh, let's finish these last five to 10 orders that we have. And we'd made quite some revenue from it, uh, quite some cash. So we were able to invest in the uh, in the sort of brand. And the brand was not so much a brand. It was more we were really good at SEO. And I was like number one on skinned black tie in Europe for a while, which is kind of a big deal. It sounds like nothing, but it's being really bish, big in a niche. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on cufflinks like gold plated cufflinks or uh, and how, how did you manage to be number one there like what did you apply to yeah seo back in the day was really simple uh, just seo yeah seo and adwords as well i think we, i could have done a lot better on seo and i we started spend time on physical stores and other companies became better than us at seo and i relied too much on adwords uh, back in those days or on paid acquisition um, and also made a few mistakes on building the website where I started. The first version of the website was for me 
And then the second version, we decided to use an agency and that just made us lose like four or five months. Uh, and from there, I've understood that you should always internalize IT, especially in the early days. You want to be close to your consumers and close to your developers or be the developer yourself. And so that started to hurt our SEO. And at some point, we started to get uh, we started to lose a lot of uh, traffic mm -hmm. because we were beat by three or four players. Um, but yeah, so essentially, very, the very beginning, it was a lot of SEO. And then it was a lot of paid acquisition, so search. Uh, AdWords, which back in the days was super simple. I mean, super simple. And back in the days, you didn't have all these optimization tools. So usually, what you would do is you would do your calculations on Excel and then upload everything into a, everything into AdWords. And and that was just amazing because there's something there's a link between behavioral psychology, human psychology, and AdWords. There just is because it's marketing and it's copywriting. So which text do you use and how do you position it and time of day and et cetera, et cetera. So there started to develop a passion for um, just uh, tech and for mm -hmm. internet. Because you're tapping into the psyche of your customers. Yeah. And you're trying to sell them what they need. It's not trying to sell them what they don't need. There's a beautiful piece by Sandra Matt that talks about, um, uh, so, you know, there's that quote, money, you can't buy happiness, but actually money can buy a little bit of happiness or life satisfaction as long as you buy the right things. And she's done this. Well, I think it depends because if there is someone, for example, who you're in love with and the person, you know doesn't give that back what you want yeah. like no money in the world will oh but that's true no okay <laughs> not like that it's more like if you're somebody who's very conscientious let's yeah. say a lot of self-control if you buy accounting software it will actually make you a little bit happier you'll feel a little bit more life satisfied if you're somebody just who's... like a really small jump in the day you mean yes mm -hmm. uh, not in the day like overall life satisfaction mm -hmm. but if you're somebody who's very extroverted typically buying entertainment or trips will actually uh increase your life satisfaction mm -hmm. through through the uh, experiences why the hell am i talking about this <laughs> uh yeah so i'm just saying we weren't just really pushing uh, products uh yeah so that's the part of marketing that was really interesting is um you got this thing nobody knows about it um and you want to sort of reach out to the people who actually are looking for this or, or should be buying this skinny black tie mm -hmm. in some instances because it's just going to make them look better. And, uh, yeah. and then in 2012, you founded To Do, yep. a tool to organize communication, yep. which was basically an early version of Slack. And yeah, exactly. then Slack came along yep. and then your company wasn't that doing that well anymore. Yeah. So if you think about that experience and if you could go back in time with all of the knowledge that you have currently, yeah. what are the things that you would do differently if you could do it all over again? Which part? The tech company? Yeah, to do. Oh, uh, I think we would have prototyped faster. So typical lean startup mistake where mm -hmm. we focused a lot on scalability. Yeah. And on yeah, we focused a lot on scalability early on, even though we didn't have scale. So we didn't do things that don't scale at first. Uh, so we didn't have that flexibility in the tech stack, mm -hmm. which means that we couldn't iterate fast enough. Also, I actually blame a little bit customer interviews. So we ran some customer interviews. Uh, and face I, to face? Yeah, face to face. I have a sampling error problem with customer interviews. We did like 10 customer interviews asking people whether they would prefer sort of a chat function versus a product management function. And for very long, the customer interviews, it, and we were doing them to the book. The um, What's it called? Um, the mom test, uh, don't lead uh, the interviewee, um, make sure you ask open-ended questions, yeah. let them come up with their pain. And when we did that, sure, but the pain that came up was a pain of project management. So that for uh, pushed our company into more of a project management tool mm -hmm. rather than sort of a chat functionality tool for a very long time based on these 10 interviews. Uh, and the problem is, I think if we'd done 100, which is basically impossible, we would have found out that there was a sampling error in the people. So it was up to chance. There was no statistical significance in that sample. And we went down the wrong error because eight out of 10 mentioned these pains. And the people you got for the interviews, did you, where did you get them from? Did you know them already? Or was oh, there were like... people who were supposed to be our target audience. Okay. So like uh, we, were, we were targeting tech companies, which are easy to find in Amsterdam. So you think that was really the main problem? No. The so there was area. not enough flexibility on, yeah. the, on the tech stack. So we couldn't prototype fast enough. Um, also, uh, so these are like internal uh, mistakes, yeah. external 550 uh, competitors, super, super saturated uh, uh, space, which is why unless you have VC funding, a lot of VC funding, you cannot, um, you, you cannot really compete in that space. 
that was another error. Uh, I mean, we were up against Stuart Butterfield, you know, who was basically four years developing his platform, one of the best UXers in the world, four years with tons of VC funding because he had that track record. I didn't have a track rec record in tech companies. I only had track record in sort of e-commerce. So there were external forces uh, uh, as well. But the thing is, I was having fun all along. So I didn't see it as a failure per se. I think that if there, and all of these were without investors. So yeah. This whole time, so the import export company, the fashion brand, e commerce was all done with cash flow. It was all bootstrapped. And the tech company, for the first time, it was with investors. And um, I think we should probably have gone for more investments, to be honest. You need a lot of money to start a, a tech company. And did that change something for you personally, getting um, that outside investment for how you, like, how you experienced it, how you felt? No, not really. Not really. I was more like my next company, if um, if it is a tech company, uh, either it needs to make money since day, from day one, or if it's a company that needs a lot of uh, investment before it can actually start generating revenue, I will only go for really, really large uh, investment round to be able to go really fast. <laughs> <laughs> And during an interview, you mentioned that you view entrepreneurship as a pile of shit that keeps getting bigger. <laughs> And as you hire more people, yeah. your spoon is getting a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a can, bit negative. <laughs> <laughs> can you elaborate on the statement a little bit? And what kind of experience in your life led to that conclusion? Yeah, I think I was just being a smart ass on that conversation, uh, on that sentence. I don't think it's like a, <laughs> a it, it's a continuous challenge. So sometimes people don't realize that, you know, it never leaves you. Mm -hmm. Entre entrepreneurship, when your your baby, your company never leaves you ever, ever, <laughs> it's like 24 seven, <laughs> unless you start getting into meditation, holotropic breathing, things like this, then you can actually uh, manage sort of the, uh, you can manage uh, that, that load, but it, it just doesn't leave you. Um, so I, I think I was just trying to stress the fact that, uh, but everybody knows this. It's like th there's always challenges, and the challenges they don't stop. There's their nature changes, so the challenges don't stop, uh, but the nature of the challenge does stop. And then that's why hiring is so important. So your spoon does actually get better if you can hire well. And I think uh, a lot of, especially the phase we're in now, where we're like going to reach a hundred people and probably go up to two hundred fifty or three hundred people within the next two or three years. Then it's it's all about hiring, hiring the, the right people, so that you can <laughs> you can sort of deal with the challenges. Uh, but this just makes sense, right? I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Sign Request. They're a really great platform if you're looking for an easy and affordable way to get your documents signed, so you don't have to worry about printing and scanning them. Instead, you can focus on growing your business. Sign Request really cares about fixing your problems. I can vouch for them, so make sure to check them out at signrequest.com. And last time when we met, you mentioned that since you started Growth Tribe, you didn't really have failures. So what are the things that you implemented based on your past learnings? Yeah. Um, so we, there were no like big failures. I think that we, we've built a company that's so experiment driven and that's so good at listening to early signals. We've not made any big fails yet. We've run a lot of experiments. Like maybe we're in the thousand, five hundred, two thousand experiments now. And we're not like a, B, uh, a B2C company. Huh? We're B2B which means you typically run less experiments. And there's never been big, big failures. There's been lots of little ones, mm -hmm. but never sort of a big one that lasts three, six months. Like we've never been in the red from a bank account uh, point of view. We've never lost big clients. Uh, we've never released a, a feature or product that cost us so much time and it actually didn't work out. And that's because we run so many small, uh, small uh, experiments. It's just like it, small experiments allow you to de-risk failure in mm -hmm. a sense and I, i think it's also from a personal point of view like i did a lot of internships so i was de-risking my career i know somebody who studied law for five years and then spent the first two three weeks after getting their law degree i think it's five years two three weeks in a law firm they're like this is terrible i hate these people i don't like law actually like, wow it took you five years to figure this out you could have figured this out a lot faster you always want to test the water before you go into it and try to find the smallest experiment possible And we do this with relationships, we do this with careers, we do this uh, inside companies. And the more you do it, maybe the better, um, the better the outcome is or the faster you get the positive uh, outcome. And how can we change our mindset to not be in the comfort zone and really apply that, let's say, on all different 
in all different phases well of that's life. really difficult you're talking about changing personality and some people would argue that there's no way to change personality to a large extent after mm -hmm. the age of 26 when you're fully formed it becomes really difficult so if you want to talk about how to change personality yeah you know it's a bit of brainwashing and that's what we try to do at growth tribe a lot of it by educating people on the growth mindset always be a lifelong learner always be curious Great, but the people probably listening to this, they're already curious. They're already lifelong learners. That we're already tapping into that audience. How do you change somebody else's personality? I don't know. There's a few things that have been proven to be able to change personality. Some of them I can't talk about. <laughs> and <laughs> other ones are more like there's, once again, it's been shown that meditation can help change the structure of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, life events. Um, um, but uh, yeah, that's difficult. And I think it's through education. I really think it's through, uh, through educating people. Um, yeah. And you mentioned that you also have a fail board at Growth Tribe, yeah. right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so essentially, this is, we actually don't use it as much anymore because we just run too many experiments. It doesn't make sense. When you want to run experimentation within a company, some of the people have the mindset, some of them don't. Uh, in, in a lot of cases and the fail board is this just this board that we have on the wall where uh, every time there's a failure on an experiment we write the name of the experiment and after 10 fails we have a cocktail party just to uh, celebrate uh, the fail and this is just a big signal it's a ritual showing you it's okay to test stuff over here and to make mistakes uh, in anti-fragile the Nassim Taleb book he's got this beautiful chart where he shows you like the cost the failures is sort of low. Mm -hmm. We call it the limited blast radius. Failing on small experiments is nothing. But if you can get a win, it's usually like 100x of what that failure was. And there's a much bigger price, much bigger risk of not trying. Uh, but I mean, this has been, you know, it's, I feel like for the past 10 years, people, have, people know this by now. I was hoping people know this. They've read the books. They've heard the story. They've heard the fail fast, etc. But it seems that no, people still don't have the mindset. Because it's not just about the mindset. It's also it's really scary to do stuff and to, for it not to be perfect. And so, the, um, so how did you become comfortable with fa failing personally? Because like you said, it's it's not easy. And yeah, a lot of people are still definitely so not comfortable with it. What's an example of a failure? Uh, well. Because every that, that's the problem. Yeah. It's like if you're having, even when you have yeah. like a philosophical discussion, not saying this is philosophy, but you need to mm -hmm. define the terms. Yeah. So what do people define as failure? I think if you don't succeed in something that you wanted to. Can you give me an example? I think if you have a certain goal uh, to do something and yeah. then, you know, it doesn't turn out the way you hoped. But what is it? Like, I'm going to run six kilometers today or is it I'm going to be uh, the world's biggest uh, lawyer, for example, in five years? Yeah, I think it can be both seen as a goal and as a failure if you don't reach it. So running six kilometers and not managing to can be the same thing as you know in a different context yeah not managing to become the lawyer that you wanted to or to finish a certain study that you wanted to yeah. or well the thing is i think it's easy for me because i've never had like a clear goal so it's always been like i want to have fun mm -hmm. i want to be sort of independent uh sort of independent although when you're a, an entrepreneur you're you're not independent of yourself let's say mm -hmm. everybody says i want to be a, i want to be my own boss well Good luck with that one. <laughs> um, and I've always wanted to, yeah, so do something, cre uh, have fun, be independent, and do something creative. And even though, like, the import-export, you can imagine that was kind of a failure. We never grew that into a very large company. We just pivoted. So we went down another route. I didn't bring a bi build a big fashion brand. That was also a failure. Like, nobody knows about Blue Lemon. Uh, well, they do. I mean, in Paris, they do, but it's not, like, this big international uh, brand. So maybe that was a failure. Um, to do same thing but i just had fun was creative along the way and i i was independent it was all stepping stones i think a lot of us don't know where we're going there's not that many visionaries in terms of products out there very few and there's not a lot of visionaries in terms of sort of personal um what i want to be uh, uh later on i think for people who have a very very clear set goal it's much more difficult if they don't reach it but and, that's not my problem and for you because you reached a lot at this point i mean growth tribe is also doing really well and you're yep. growing really fast yep. so what are your goals for the future and what's like driving you in general i mean honestly it's like having fun uh continuing to do stuff that's creative and design and at the moment what i found is hanging out with cool people i mean the definition of success should be like i'm happy to wake up in the morning and yeah every morning i'm happy to wake up uh, so that's what keeps uh, driving me then in terms of growth tribe, 
I do see something that um, a lot of people can't navigate. Uh, I mean, this is going to sound salesy, but it's not. A lot of people can't navigate the digital landscape. They're completely lost, completely lost. And uh, I've been in the digital landscape for the past like 14 years. My buddies are, the people at Growth Tribe are. We want to help people to navigate this landscape. Uh, and it can, it's what's called a techno uh, future shock or techno stress or tech anxiety especially maybe not the younger generation so much, but a little bit older, like 35 plus. I mean, just using Google correctly is a superpower. It is. So imagine knowing a little bit about landing page optimization, behavioral psychology, uh, understanding how analytics works, understanding the basics of data science, understanding the basics of blockchain, maybe, understanding what the components of UX are, uh, understanding which tools to leverage, how you can be a developer without being a developer by using certain tools. And it really empowers people. And it's the first time I'm sort of in a company where there's an emotional gratification for the work we do. And there's an emotional gratification of educating people to navigate this digital landscape. So I want to keep pushing this. And the goal is to do this to as many people as possible, to help empower as many people as possible. There was this report recently where there's no more productivity gains in the economy. Uh, so, And one of the reasons for this lack of productivity gain is that we've got all this great technology, but there's not enough people who know how to use the technology. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully help people leverage technology before it leverages them and allow them to feel comfortable. I do. I am a tech optimist. I do think if more people know how to leverage technology, they will use it for good, not for bad. Mm -hmm. um, especially if it's people who are not leveraging it right now, uh, let's say. All right. Something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and throughout your entrepreneurial career, yeah. um, what has been your greatest struggle so far? My greatest struggle so far has been um, business view, uh, from a business point of view. But you can also go into your personal life. Well, it's been separating business life and personal life. For sure. <laughs> can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so it's your company's never off in your head. It's always uh, on. Even when it's only 5% on, it's still there. So it's really being able to separate all of that. And, um, you know, I have two kids, uh, a family, and it's been learning to let go a little bit and also, like, disconnect. Um, yeah, and I've only been learning to do that recently, um, and I'm getting better at it, but that's maybe been the, the best struggle to actually disconnect. And how are you able to disconnect? Like, what are you implementing? Because you say that that happened recently. Yeah, well, recently it's happened like for three, four years now, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and it's just been doing a lot of work on myself. And it's just the um, uh, breathing exercises, changing diets, uh, more sports, more mindfulness. Um, it's all that new age stuff. <laughs> all that millennial <laughs> new age stuff would actually really works. A lot of stuff from... Uh, uh, maybe Eastern uh, civilization, Eastern culture a little bit. Uh, that's really helped. And it's actually not only, it's made me a better entrepreneur, actually. Better in what sense? Uh, I address problems differently mm -hmm. uh, from a different angle and uh, more quality work, more creativity, more empathy, more understanding, uh, more energy, more focus, more deep work. Um, yeah, it's really, uh, really helped. Um, so all that new agey stuff, kids at home, just uh it sounds a bit wacky but it it actually works so can you t tell us maybe how a typical day for you looks like and how much time you spend on that new agey stuff oh wow uh maybe let's do the average day because no two days are the same uh wake up at six uh i do like sports for half an hour just some it depends sometimes it's either swimming but then it's a little bit longer it's an hour or just half an hour just some workout at home um then at 6 30 i prepare breakfast for the kids oh that's nice <laughs> yeah uh at seven uh i will wake up uh, uh the kids um and then uh yeah uh just spend some family time so uh until like 8 8 15 drop the kids off at school at 8 15 uh, I'm in work and on days where I, I don't drop the kids, uh, then it's more like I'm trying to be at work at like 7.30, something like this. Uh, and then deep work in the morning, as much deep work as possible in the morning. So I see that 
what we see is our emotional balance is higher in the morning for anyone who's not a night owl which is so check this out it's called daniel pink a book called when there's also a nice little explanation about it on google and i do my deep work in the morning the deep hard stuff i do it from like nine until sort of one now the thing is i don't eat until three or four in the afternoon so i just fast want more new age stuff but i fast until four my first food is at four so i'm able to be fully focused until at four but you eat breakfast so no don't no eat. breakfast so i only eat between four in the afternoon and between eight at night it's called the 24 you don't eat for 20 hours and you do eat for for four hours i used to only do the skipping breakfast and then i would have lunch but now i've pushed it even more i still get the same amount of calories as anybody else i get 2,000 calories but i just get it during a shorter time period from four to eight p.m And this has really helped me just have full focus um, during that period. So deep, deep work until uh, one. Normally, if you eat, you're, you get a bit of dip because your gl blood glucose level rises and you get sort of a, a little bit of a dip. When I used to have that dip, I would do administrative work in the afternoon from like one to two or one to two thirty, And then I would do from like two thirty until the evening. Uh, I would do more like creative work or social work. Uh, so meetings and meeting with people. Uh, however, now, since I'm able to fully focus, I try to do my deep work until like two or three in the afternoon. And then I do the emails and then I do the Slack and all the little stuff that's really easy. And then I try to have the meetings in the afternoon. That's my game plan. Uh, and then I try to always do at least two hours of podcast per day. So I have the chance to commute. I commute. So I, I get like about an hour and a half of two hours of commute uh, where I just fill my brain with information, either reading or listening to it, technology podcasts, psychology podcasts, architecture podcasts. Uh, so just filling my brain with cool stuff. Um, but that that's what like the archetype day looks like, but actually mm -hmm. no day looks like this. But that's sort of what I aim for. That's the ideal. Yeah, that's like the ideal. I exactly. Uh, and trying to always have like these two, two hours at least of, of information uh, per day, new information on like random subjects sometimes. And then typically like go to bed around midnight something like this and try to try to get like an hour of reading from midnight until one something like this and then you go to bed at one o'clock yeah i usually fall asleep around one and then yeah wake up at six matthew walker says this is terrible because uh you need sleep and it's not good for my central nervous system it's not good for my hormone levels yeah uh, but i feel great so <laughs> it should be okay i think that i get good quality sleep and i don't have so much anxiety as i used to have like I used to have a lot more anxiety. Why? Like healthy anxiety. Just, you know, it's you've got a company. Everything can go wrong and you're everything. So there's uh, finances, there's accounting, there's legal, there's the clients, there's the customers, there's the collection, uh, there's the tooling, there's this, there's that, there's the drama, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's never a moment where you can uh, you can rest. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's just on, on, a little bit of entrepreneur stress or entrepreneur anxiety. But I actually discovered like uh, some supplements for this. Mm -hmm. There's a supplement called ashwagandha. Ashwagandha. Yeah. Beautiful. It's like this uh, fantastic uh, root. And there's another one called L-theanine, L-theanine. It takes the edge off of caffeine. I would really recommend it to people. Uh, that plus the sport plus a little bit of mindfulness has really helped remove all of that anxiety. Uh, so now I just, I sleep like a baby for five hours, but like a baby. And sometimes it's a bit more, right? Sometimes falls at 12.30 and actually wake up at 6.30, for example. And what, what's the biggest trigger for your anxiety? Oh, just, well, what some people call the desire to succeed, I call it a little bit of anxiety. It's like the anxiety to succeed, the anxiety to do good. So is that like a pressure you put on yourself, you would say? Yeah. Or do you think that's triggered by your environment or someone? No, I mean, when I was a, like a teen, And I was still kind of cool, a little bit cool, like friends, social life, you know, alcohol, all that stuff. Uh, totally normal. But I would still like, you know, sometimes skip a party to make sure I'd study, to make sure I get a, I do good on that test. That's a bit, it's not, I don't know if it's anxiety really, but it's like uh, achievement anxiety a little bit, you know, you just want to. And was there also a certain event when you didn't reach what you wanted to? I don't see it that way. I see it, everything's a journey. So it's like, yeah, like I said, like the import export company should have been bigger, but then we moved on. I moved on to something else. Uh, the brand, sh I mean, I didn't leave it for business reasons. I mm -hmm. left it more for love, you know? Yeah. Uh, love, just for love. <laughs> That's why I left the company. So it was like not really a failure. It's just I moved on. And same thing, like to do the task management tool. Yeah, okay, it was like a failure because it didn't do good, but then I moved on to something else. 
So there must be a really good saying about this, where it's you know it's not about the end goal, enjoy the journey. It's really about the it really is about the the journey, having fun along the way, listening to early signals, knowing who you are a little bit, and it's like with companies, as long as you have some guiding principles, I want to make sure I have fun, I want to make sure that I can do something that's a bit creative and I, I can be quite independent, then nothing's really a failure as long as those three are still sort of a sort of a ticked. But in terms of like failing. I mean, there has been one or two times when, like, I didn't do good at a conference, for example. I wasn't as good as I would have wanted to be. But who cares? Move on. You know, don't. I'm very future focused. So I'm always looking at the next step. And if you fail now, uh, okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> Tomorrow's another day. Uh, uh, and it's funny because part of me is like uh, a little bit. Some people say that I'm a little bit negative mm -hmm. or skeptical. I mean, I, this T-shirt says the worst is yet to come. For example, yeah, it's a Schopenhauer quote. Um, but if you approach life like this a little bit, being a little bit realistic, there's a book by Andy Grove called Only the Paranoid Survive. Mm -hmm. At least you won't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to uh, be happy when good stuff actually uh, happens. So I don't put too much hope on what might be or what might actually happen. So how do you manage your expectation then? Because that's sometimes quite hard. I don't really have expectations, I think. I might regret this one later, but my <laughs> expectations are not so... So I really believe that if I put the right pieces in place, mm -hmm. then the outcome will be okay. So in that sense, I'm not skeptical or negative. I'm actually really positive, really mm -hmm. positive about the future. And also, like, it's, honestly, having this long-term orientation really helps because mm -hmm. I'm really trying to focus on... Um, and also, by the way, we're just lucky, right? We're just lucky <laughs> to sort of uh, be... Uh, it's really corny, but... Just be alive in this fantastic city. Very lucky. What the Americans call being blessed. <laughs> <let's say. laughs> yeah. And I just, I really like to compare my situation. Yeah, I'm just lucky, privileged. Very privileged. So it's hard to sort of be negative in that sense. But that wasn't the question. The question was more about, I can't remember the question. It was a good question. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> And you have still maybe some kind of book recommendations or resources um, that someone can check out if they want to dive more into topics like data or AI for someone that doesn't have really background knowledge. Uh, yeah, machine learning, I would read. So let's do a few. If you want to dive into machine learning or AI, I would read the book called Prediction Machines. Mm -hmm. It explains supervised, unsupervised, uh, some, some use cases and just the beauty of uh, predictions. Um, a really easy to read book. If you wanted to get into data, like first step, I would dive into Lean Analytics. I think that's mm -hmm. a really good one. Um, what else was there? If you, uh, I've got a lot of book recommendations. <laughs> uh, the one I'm reading at the moment, Stanislas Grof, uh, The New Realms of the Human Unconscious. That's a really good one. Um, so anything by Stanislas Grof is just amazing. And another great book I read recently. Uh, oh, there's this beautiful one. It's called um, Financial Markets and uh, Tech Bubbles, I think. Financial Markets and Economic Bubbles. It's an economic book, so it's one of those books that has a terrible title, but it, that's an amazing uh, read. And another one that I'm reading at the moment. Um, well, I mean, for every, anyone that likes this format of the podcast that you're doing, there's, of course, Hard Thing About Hard Things that I think a lot of people have read because it's a lot about failure and the truth. And then there's another one by Scott Belsky, the guy who uh, created Behance, that's called The Messy Middle. It's okay. It's an okay book, but it also talks about the struggle. And he talks about the messy middle. Everybody always talks about, and the press always talks about the beginning and the yeah. end, but nobody talks, talks about, about the middle, the middle. Mm -hmm. where uh, all, all the actual stuff uh, happens. So that's that's kind of a good one. Um, and then mm, one more. Let's do one more about... Uh, I think if you want to know a little bit more about lifelong learning, and there's a really good one. It's called uh, The Case Against Education, and it explains why the education system is completely broken. Um, 80, so 78% of people, or it wasn't more, was it 82? 78 or 82% of people don't do a job that has nothing to do with the studies that they do. Um, and that time could have been used a lot more wisely, I think. Um, and it's just a huge case against a little bit university and mm -hmm. it's old romantic way of teaching people and that this needs to really change soon and it's also why you know we built this uh, company to revolutionize education the way people are educated and as you're reading so many books like how do you manage it's not that? that many yeah it's uh i read so i read like if it's you call cover to cover it's like 30 per year 
Okay. Uh, if it's not cover to cover mm-hmm. with a little bit of planned reading, I'm at like 50, 60. And if you count audiobooks, I'm at like 90. So it's not that much, actually. Audiobooks, it's great. Audiobooks have doubled my book consumption because I can just listen to the <laughs> yeah, books. And a typical yeah. book is like seven hours, unless like it's a Robert Greene book, like The Laws of Human Nature. That's like 17 hours. But typical book is five, six, or seven hours. And then the rest, yeah, 20 books a year. That's not a lot. That's one book every two weeks. A book typically takes six, seven hours to read. So that's pretty simple. Uh, and then also other books, I use what's called planned reading, mm-hmm. which is basically, I'm doing a video actually on how to read more books because a lot of people, they treat books as like these divine objects that you've got to read end to end. Yeah. And planned reading is cool as you plan which chapters you're actually going to read um, before mm-hmm. and you only read those chapters because th- those are the ones that interest you. Oh, that's that's cool. I can yeah. totally put a link in the, yeah. in the video. Okay, yeah. Awesome. Um, and do you have like a last key takeaway that you would still like to share with us? Something that helped you grow personally? Um, good question. Yeah, work hard. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> I think it's important. Like, people don't realize how much work it takes to actually build a company. It is 80 or 90 hour weeks. And a lot of people say like, you know, what? Yeah, some, a lot of people... Uh, say that it's luck or a little bit of yeah privilege or yeah a little bit lucky timing yeah took me like how old am i now i'm 35 started when i was 20 it's been 15 years of just freaking 80 hour work weeks (laughs) (laughs) so just put in the hard work it's really about hard work uh some people do get lucky some people do get a uh, it just happens to be at the right place at the right time but most of the time it's just working hard. So you got to love it. If you don't love it, it's going to be really, really difficult. And start early if possible. All right. Yeah. And uh, how can people find you online? How can they get in touch with you? Yeah. So they can check us out at uh, www.growthtribe.io. Uh, and they can reach, uh, they should follow us on Instagram because we post some nice content. They can add me on Instagram. It's at, although I'm trying to grow it up at the moment, but I'm terrible. No, actually, add me on LinkedIn. It's much better. That's my platform. So David, our new A-R-N-O-U-X on LinkedIn and follow Growth Tribe on YouTube. We have some uh, pretty cool uh, content. Thank you so much for being here and yeah. sharing all of your knowledge with us yeah, um, so. and your story. And for everyone who's watching or listening, I can highly recommend to check out Growth Tribe on YouTube. They have some great educational videos or to just follow them on LinkedIn. They post a lot of stuff. And make sure to comment below what your favorite learning was of today.